Um, so what we'll be covering today with fire setters, I'll give you kind of common characteristics we find to do with fire setters, theories of why fire setting occurs, different typologies we have of typing fire setters, and then lastly, a little bit on um, treatment and what we know about recidivism. Um, now, you know, fire setting is a very interesting crime to study for a number of reasons. You know, um, you know, quite often the type of offender students are most interested in are serial killers. But the reality is that we haven't learned a whole lot more about serial killers than we already knew a couple of decades ago. And it's not that clear we're going to learn a whole lot more. And obviously the implications are limited because you know, there isn't a great deal of focus on rehabilitating serial killers because their sentence will usually be for life. Um, fire setting, on the other hand, is something that we're still learning a lot about. There's still a lot more to learn, a lot of current exciting research happening. And most fire setters will eventually be released from prison. So there's a lot of importance also on putting together effective treatment for them. What's also interesting about fire setting as a crime is that very rarely are serial fire setters ever focused on the kind of danger that can result from their crime. Usually they see the setting of the fire as something that's lessening their anxiety, that's something that's peaceful and playful and tranquil. Okay, so that also means that psychologically they're very different from a lot of other offenders that we study. They're more likely to have a mental disorder than any other offender. Um, but also, because they're typically less violent in nature, because the, you know, even if the, if the um, fire is deadly, usually that's not what they intended. Okay. Now, obviously, there's various reasons as to why one might set a fire. Some are more personal than others. Someone might set a fire to get back at someone who wronged them. But these tend to be isolated cases, okay? But when we talk about serial fire setters who repeatedly set fires, okay, their kind of um, target is typically less personal. Okay. Um, also, when we look at you know the kind of history or mythology of fire, you know it's been characterized as something of a deity in many cultures and in many um, religions. Um, you know, in Greek mythology, Prometheus gave fire as a gift to humans in order to separate them from animals. Um, fire was one of the core elements of nature, and so for people to have mastery over this represented some mastery over nature. Um, of course, vital for many vital tasks, um, you know, from cooking food to um, um, metalwork and so, so on. Um, but also, of course, in mythology, it's sometimes been represented as something less of a deity and sometimes something is more wrathful and dangerous you know of course in christianity used to represent hell a place of forever torment for those who you know, sinned and didn't repent um and of course fire is often a very deadly crime as well um some terms to be familiar with okay fire setting is a behavior okay Arson is the crime. It refers to illegally setting a fire. Okay. Um, and I'll come back to pyromaniac and pyromania. And, you know, sometimes people believe that people who repeatedly set fires must therefore have pyromania. But that's not actually the case. And I'll come to distinguish that. Now, arson is not an uncommon crime. It's not a very well understood crime. And it's one of the hardest to investigate for police, one of the hardest to prosecute for lawyers. So one of the crimes easiest to get away with, one of the crimes least likely to result in a conviction. Um, only about 17% of arson cases ever result in a conviction. But it's one of the easiest crimes to commit and not an uncommon one. Two countries in the world by far are suffering from arson far more than the others. The, the first is Australia. There's an act of arson committed every hour of every day in Australia. And second is the US. Um, in the US, about 250 to half a million acts of arson every year. They claim somewhere between about 500 and 700 lives every year. In 
direct property damage, it costs the community about $1 billion, okay? That's not even including, you know, investigations and all the other kind of peripheral costs that might happen because of arson. Um, and it's not regarded as a primary offense or classification in the FBI's crime classification manual. It's given a secondary offense along with crimes like drunk driving and vagrancy, okay? <clears throat> so pyromania is a disorder in the DSM um, refers to a compulsive need to set fires. Um, it was included in the first edition of the DSM, um, left out in the second edition, and then the third and the fourth both listed it as an impulse control disorder, along with you know disorders like kleptomania and pathological gambling. Um, in the DSM-5, it's been given a new category um, under disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. Um, and I'll touch upon how it is heavily tied to both impulse control and early appearing conduct disorders. But pyromania is a very rare condition, okay? About 3% at most of arsonists meet the criteria for pyromania. In many samples of arsonists, there hasn't been any that meet the criteria of pyromania, giving some debates over to what extent this is really a real disorder. Okay, so pyromania, a mental disorder, fire setting, a behavior, and then arson is the crime, okay? <clears throat> now, arsonists, particularly serial fire setters who repeatedly set fires, are typically white males, usually late teens and kind of early 20s. Um, very socially isolated, introverted, rated as being physically unattractive and unassertive, okay? In comparison to general public and to other groups of criminals, okay? Usually far less aggressive vocally, far more timid, much more socially reserved. Um, much higher rates of intellectual disability amongst this group in comparison to other groups of offenders and higher um, disorder, mental illnesses as well, which I'll come to. Um, but according to some studies, more than half of convicted arsonists have a mental illness. Um, typically uneducated, unemployed, unmarried, if they are employed, typically an unskilled job and typically live alone. Um, also more likely to have suicidal tendencies than other groups of offenders. <clears throat> I'll tell you about a case that I think illustrates a lot of these common characteristics of fire setters. And this is Peter George Dinsdale. Um, he never knew his biological father um, and his mother um, worked as a prostitute and was verbally and emotionally abusive to him. Um, he was born with a deformed arm and a um, motor muscular condition and was prone to um, spasms when he was a kid and because of this his mother would call him the freak um, he was sent to live with his grandmother for most of his childhood from about the age of six who lived in Hull and from about from about this year about this age he attended a school that was for handicapped children either mentally or physically um, he was the frequent target of bullies okay quite relentlessly um, known as Daft Pete amongst the neighborhood um, and he was known to kind of come back against his bullies with some kind of verbal remarks such as, you'll be sorry about this one day or you know, one day you'll regret this. And you know, these were really just taking as idle remarks but or, uh, idle threats. Um, but in fact, um, in 1980, it was revealed that he had killed at least 27 people via at least 30 different fires. Um, the first one that we know of was when he was nine years old and he set fire to a local shopping center, costing at that time more than a hundred thousand pounds in, in property damage. Um, his first fatal fire was when he was 12. He set fire to the home of a child who attended the same school as him. Everyone else made it out, but because this child was 
physically handicapped. He wasn't able to get out of the house in time and so perished in the flames. <clears throat> um, over the next several decades, he committed a number of other um, fires. Some of them random at the homes of strangers. Um, one of them, a 70 year old man in, in the um, in the neighborhood, um, Peter George Dinsdale put accelerant through the letterbox and then um, and then lit um, the accelerant. Um, the, the police didn't know they were looking for an arsonist. They thought the old man had um, knocked over a heater in the house and that this is what had started the fire. And you know a lot of these other arson cases also were kind of put down as accidents. Um, one of them, some of them were a bit more personal. There was one neighbor who had a collection of pigeons in the backyard and Peter George Dinsdale was out playing and the old man came and yelled at him for disturbing the pigeons and told him to go away. Um, and Peter George Dinsdale came back later that night to set the man's house on fire, killing him. And then he also snapped the necks of all of the pigeons that the man killed. <clears throat> um, one of the worst was at um, Wensley Lodge, which was a retirement home and um, 11 were killed in this fire and six others were injured again it was put down as an accident the police thought that a, a electrician had been there earlier that day um, had done something to the boiler that had ended up resulting in the fire the police didn't really know that they were looking for an arsonist until the selby street fire in, in which peter george dinsdale killed the three Hasty brothers who lived on Selby Street. Um, the Hasty brothers were known by police as kind of petty criminals, and they thought that maybe um, a, a previous victim of theirs had kind of set the fire in, in re retaliation. Um, they began by interviewing previous boyfriends of one of the brothers, one of which was Peter George Dinsdale. And not only did he confess immediately to the fire, but he confessed to nine others that he said had also been fatal. The police were initially skeptical, skeptical, but they said, they said, okay, get in the back of the police car, show me where you set these nine fires. Okay, and sure enough, the nine sites that he, he, he took them to were sites where fires had been started under, under suspicious circumstances um, and where people had, um, had, had died in the, in the flames. When asked why he set the fires, he, he said, he felt tingles in his hands and felt a need to set the fires. And also that he despised people and was devoted to fire. Fire was his master. Now, for the most part, like I say, um, 27 people killed, at least 30 fires. Most of them strangers, okay? Only very few of them he knew. Even those he knew, it's not clear that there was any kind of bad blood between them, right? The, 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 the young boy, for example, went to the same school, but there's no evidence that there was kind of any bad blood or reason as to why Peter George Dinsdale would want him harmed. Um, so in some ways, he seems to meet the criteria for a pyromaniac, okay? The kind of reports of needing, a, 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 having a desire to set fires, having this kind of compulsion, having these tingles in his hands that he reported. Yes, he knew some of them, like the old man, the neighbor he had disturbed, Okay, but it's not too surprising that, you know, someone who has a compulsive need to set fires, when they're wronged by someone, they'll also choose setting fires as a means of, you know, exercising their wrath. Okay, so, you know, quite often in cases, there might be a combination of motivations. Okay. <clears throat> now, historically, there is a number of early appearing theories of fire setting. It was initially believed that fire setting was a crime mainly committed by women. Um, and you know there was unscientific explanations put forward as to why this was the case, defective intelligence and um, menstrual difficulties. Um, in fact, most arsonists are male, um, but most of the early theories centered around why women were setting fires. Um, Particularly in, in Germany and Austria in the late 1800s, there was a number of abused um, servant girls who set fires to the homes that they cared for. Um, 
sometimes as a kind of means of escape as they were kind of, you know, servants to a, a pretty uh, abusive um, employer, then this might be one way to kind of, you know, end that employment if they can get away with not being detected for the one who started the fire. Um, a kind of modern day version of this is when psychiatric patients set fire to their cells in hopes of being rehoused. Um, and also some isolated au pairs who have been sent abroad to work as an au pair as part of an agency. And then the agency has not agreed to, um, to uh, give them flights home um, so long as they're still in, in employment and they haven't had the means of doing so themselves. Um, Olivia Rayner, ultimately acquitted, but was accused um, of setting fire to the baby in the home that she was looking after when she was working for an au pair agency. <clears throat> and then psychoanalytic theories, you know, heavily influenced by Freud's ideas, um, mainly arguing that, you know, abnormalities during psychosexual development and repressed hostility towards parents and repressed sexual desires were really what was um, driving fire setting behavior. As evidence for this, some theorists have put forward case studies of some cases that you know seem to have been sexually motivated. The individual seems to have been sexually excited by setting the fires. They, for example, stayed behind at the scene to masturbate. Um, but these are not common cases, okay? Um, in Lewis and Yornell's study, only about 3% of arson cases could be classed as um, sexually motivated. Now, Lewis and Yornell's study is an old one, but it's one I'll, I'll, I'll cite a number of times because of the large sample um, of over 1,000 arsonists from the US. Um, also, there's no evidence so far that psychoanalytical therapy helps with lowering recidivism, okay? So it's not an effective strategy for treatment. So, you know, if the, if the therapeutic approach based upon this model isn't working, then that would indicate that the theory isn't really getting at the core of, as, as to why most people are committing arson. Another theory arguing to explain it is social learning theory. Of course, you know, it's sending ideas from Bandura's theory. Um, so, you know, this has been kind of learned behavior um, and maybe a, pro a product of reinforcement as well. You know, so this, you know, reinforcement could be sensory excitement. So there might be excitement from setting the fire itself, or it could be the attention that's drawn to the fire. Um, certainly, there is good evidence that early exposure to fires increases the risk of setting fires later in life. A number of fire setters has parents who were fire setters or a father who was a fireman or they lived rurally as children and so from an early age had to set fires to cook their own food and to warm the house and as a source of light. And in Lewis and Yarnell's study, so it's over 2,000 arsonists in the US, um, 98 of them were volunteer firemen or fire bus. Uh, uh, something I'll come back to, um, but you know, basically a kind of hero complex in which one sets fires and then is the one to put the fires out and is then regarded as a hero in their kind of local community, because it's typically very small rural towns in the US that have volunteer firemen rather than um, you know, a dedicated firemen who are, are doing that as their full-time occupation. Um, so obviously that's a pretty good illustration of the kind of behavioral social learning theories, okay, because they're obviously getting getting very you know, tangible um, reinforcement from, from setting fire, being regarded as a hero in their community. Um, the displaced aggression hypothesis by Jackson, arguing that fire setting is a result of harboring hostility towards someone and not being able to vocalize that hostility to confront the person you're angry at. And so finding some other outlet for the rage, okay? And indeed this could be fire setting. The fire setters are very non-confrontational, okay? In comparison to other offenders. Um, also a number of them 
and experienced hostile parenting or were abused as children and began fire setting as children. So that would make sense if you're harboring hostility towards your parents that don't, you know, aren't able to confront them because they're the parent figure, then you have to find potentially some other outlet for that rage, which in this case might be fire setting. Also, if we give fire setters, you know, questionnaires to measure their proneness for feelings of jealousy or envy or anger or other negative emotions, they don't score lower than other than other criminals. Okay, so it's the case that they're not vocalizing negative emotions, but not the case that they're not experiencing negative emotions. Okay, they're harboring just as much negativity as other offenders. They're just not confronting people about it. Um, but this mainly seems to apply to male serial arsonists. Um, female serial arsonists don't, don't really seem to have the same problem with um, kind of opening up about their rage that they might be experiencing. <clears throat> Another explanation is that arson is a form of communication resulting from a kind of communication deficit. Um, if one you know, is desperate for change, for example, in their situation. So like I say, the kind of psychiatric patient who maybe wants to be rehoused, then maybe fire setting is one way of kind of expressing their desire. Um, in one study out of 29 arsonists, five were motivated by communicative arson. Um, indeed, many female arsonists do seem to have difficulty communicating what exactly it is that they want in situations and often do use arson to settle disputes. Um, but it does seem to be more applicable to female arsonists than males. Another study I'll cite a couple of times is the study by Ritz. Over 150 cases of UK arsonists that he actually interviewed, and he has pretty good case study examples um, in his text. Um, communicative arson was the fourth, the fourth leading cause of these. <laughs> But these are all single factor explanations, okay? And obviously it's unlikely that a single factor explanation of anything when it comes to human behavior is going to explain all of the cases, right? Psychoanalytic theory, mainly explaining those sexually motivated crimes isn't explaining cases due to mental illness, okay? Communicative arson, you know, dealing with a number of arsonists who suffer from communication deficit issues, but obviously, isn't going to explain all cases, okay? If we want a more encompassing theory that will give us a larger idea of why people commit fires, then we need a more multifaceted approach, right? A theory that considers multiple factors rather than just one. Probably the earliest example of this was Jackson's functional analysis theory, arguing that fire setting is due to pre-existing factors and then triggering events. Now, the pre-existing factors could really be anything that leads to aggression and poor coping strategies, okay? So, you know, ab abuse early in life or neglect, for example, could be situations. Um, but the, the idea here is that they leave the person with feelings of aggressiveness and don't allow them to have developed coping mechanisms for dealing with that, okay? So therefore, when they experience a triggering event, which could be, you know, the loss of a loved one, a breakup, going bankrupt, losing a job. They don't, they don't have successful coping mechanisms in place to deal with this, and so might be more likely to resort to setting a fire. But of course, the theory doesn't explain why some individuals with these pre-existing factors don't go on to commit fires, and why some who commit fires don't have these pre-existing factors. Another one, which is really developed out of social learning theory, but trying to look at, at it from a more multifaceted lens, is Feynman's dynamic behavior theory. Similarly, arguing that historical factors act as pre-existing factors that predispose one to being more vulnerable. Okay, so this could be poor social skills, poor self-esteem. Um, and then fire setting behavior, if it occurs, really should be only likely if it's reinforced either through external um, rewards or internal rewards, okay? So the external reward 
you know, could be getting revenge of someone, getting even that you're upset with. And the internal reward could be a, a feeling of excitement from setting fire and watching the flames. <laughs> But currently the best theory is by Teresa Gannon, the multi um, trajectory theory of fire setting. Um, Teresa Gannon is probably the world expert right now in fire setting. Um, she has a book out called The Psychology of Arson. Um, and really what this theory argues is that there are a number of kind of pre-existing factors or predisposing factors that you know, might be developmental in nature or biological you know, making one maybe more impulsive um, or could be more kind of situational, social in, 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 in nature. And these result in psychological vulnerabilities, okay? So again, poor coping, um, co poor coping strategies, you know, low self-esteem, poor social skills, and so on. But there are then a number of different trajectories um, that a fire setter might follow, okay? So various pathways into fire setting behavior. So I'll explain each of these separately. Um, Antisocial cognition is when one sets a fire, but they're not actually interested in fire setting itself, okay? The fire setting is part of some other criminal behavior, you know, so maybe, you know, they're committing vandalism as part of a gang or part of a group, okay? Um, graffitiing and then also maybe committing arson as part of that. Um, or maybe, um, they're they're committing some crime and then they commit arson to try and conceal evidence okay so generally it's a criminal lifestyle but no particular interest in fire setting behavior itself the grievance then is when one uses fire to get even okay so this could be an ex-lover or an ex-employer you know someone who you feel has wronged you and then you know setting fire to their property or their belongings is the kind of method you use to get even with them so again it's no particular interest in fire itself okay it's just using this as a means of retribution and then the third is fire interest okay so this is the person who is fascinated by fire this might include the pyromaniac the one who is sexually excited by setting fires the one who is excited by doing so okay so they're setting fires because they're interested in setting fires and, and, and that itself is the motivation. And then there are those who set fires to express themselves emotionally as a need for recognition or to communicate what it is that they want. Um, so, you know, this could be a cry for help, unable to express themselves vocally. And so this is kind of something that they resort to. Um, it could be as means of self-harming or a suicide attempt. Um, could be a need for recognition, um, hoping to improve status or be relocated, for example. Now, there's two types or subtypes, rather, of this pathway. One is unable to voice needs through other means, okay, which is the emotionally expressive type, which is the type that's more impulsive, okay. So when this type is feeling agitated or incredibly anxious, they don't know how to vocalize what it is that's bothering them, okay? And they found that fire setting is a way of kind of releasing that tension, releasing that anxiety, making them more at peace. Um, the, the need for recognition is using fire to communicate, but is not so impulsive. It's more instrumental, okay? So it's more calculated. They think, you know, if I set a fire, to my cell, I might get a better cell. Um, or recently in England, in the um, Isle of Wight, um, there was a, a homeless man who was given shelter um, and he didn't like the shelter he had been given and set fire to it, hoping he would be rehoused. Instead, he got a criminal conviction and went to prison for it. Um, and then lastly is the multifaceted approach, which is a combination of the first one and the third one, okay? So they use crime, sorry, they use fire as part of their criminal behavior, but also they're interested in fire, okay? So sometimes they might set fires just because it interests them, but also they have a criminal lifestyle and they might set fires as part of that lifestyle. Now, one reason as to why this model is 
so popular is also because people on different pathways have been found to respond differently to different types of treatments, okay? So the antisocial cognition type, typically um, more impulsive, for example, than these next two types, and so might benefit from some treatment that includes impulse control. Um, the second type, usually more difficulties with interpersonal skills, and so might you know, benefit from you know, advice on dealing with conflicts successfully resolving conflicts in a more suitable manner. Yeah. So the grievance is to get even with someone who's angered you, okay? Um, there isn't necessarily a, a logical goal to it, okay? It's just really to get retribution. Whereas the need for recognition type does have a goal that they're working towards. Okay. Any other questions? Um, some implicit theories of fire setting, you know, some distorted cognitions and faulty thinking styles that are found to be common to this group of offenders. Um, you know, some of them are similar to criminals at large, okay, and we've already seen some of them are, are a bit more unique to the fire setters. You know, this kind of dangerous world view again, you know, it's a dog eat dog world. The, you know, the, the, the world is a hostile place. People can't be trusted, you know, quite often stemming from, you know, abusive households and you know, not being taught about loving relationships. Um, a normalization of violence, okay, so pretty desensitized to violence. You know, it doesn't really see much wrong with using violence as a way of resolving disputes and conflicts. Um, the fire is a powerful tool okay, that it can be used to send a clear, powerful message. Um, the fire is fascinating, something that's exciting, that's thrilling, peaceful, soothing, mesmerizing. And then also sometimes the fire is controllable. Okay, They often set fires thinking that they'll be in control of the fire. It won't get out of control. It won't get larger than they intended. It won't kill anyone if, unless they intended. You know, but it, you know, time and time again, the fires, in fact, get out of control and you know are fatal even when that wasn't what was intended. Also, there are typing systems for arsons, arsonists. Okay, um, now these themselves are not theories. Okay, they're classification systems, but they might be the starting point for later theories to develop to explain particular types. Um, you know, they can aid with the direction of police investigations. The FBI's crime classification manual does typically split offenders into various types and then gives investigation recommendations for each particular type. But as you've hopefully seen by this point, there are obvious issues with classifying systems like this, right? First of all, classifying criminals is always going to be subjective. In the exams, you know, I give you pretty minimal information so that it only can go under one type of offender, right, in your questions. But in real life, once you have a large amount of data, it won't all perfectly reflect one particular type. There's going to be some conflicting information, some overlap, okay? In, in real life, no one's really a textbook example of a given type. And so then it's quite subjective in terms of what type they fall under. Also, a lot of these classifying systems really focus on one motivation when really human behavior is often driven by a number of motivations, including criminal behavior. Um, and there's no evidence that these typing systems help with treatments. Now, there's a number of typing systems. Some I'll give more focus than others because some have been more validated than others, meaning that other researchers have also found good evidence for the prevalence of these types in, in their samples. Um, you know, Lewis and Yarnell's study, I've mentioned of over 2,000 arsonists in the US, really believe that there were five main groups. Um, the first, accidental fire setters, didn't mean to set the fire, were confused at the time of doing so. Um, delusional fire setter have some sort of mental illness, you know, experiencing delusions, hallucinations. This is playing parts into their fire setting behavior. 
Um, six driven fire setters, those sexually excited by the fire. Um, revenge seeking fire setters, those you know getting even at a particular person, ex employer, ex lover, something like that, is retribution. Um, and then child fire setters, which I'll come back to on a future slide, okay? Because usually fire setting in children is a kind of symptom or manifestation of a conduct disorder and is usually accompanied by a number of other symptoms. <clears throat> um, another type, um, revenge fire setting, thrill seeking, institutionalized fire setting, which is you know, psychiatric patients setting fire to their cells, um, insurance claim, vandalism, and to conceal a crime. I'll unpack some of these more as I talk about some other types. Yeah. Um, so this would include perhaps people who have been found not guilty because of um, lack of competence or something like that, but they've set the fire because they were confused at the time, okay? Not deliberately is the key, okay? Which is what's separating it from these delusional types who were experiencing delusions at the time, but the fire setting was deliberate. Exactly, or it just wasn't deliberate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, for sure. That could tie into the distinction between murder and manslaughter. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, there's a number of those typing systems. Okay, what I mainly want to focus on is the one by Ricks. Um, and then the FBI's classification manual as well for separating types. Um, Ricks developed 15 categories for the over 150 arsonists in his group. Then what's interesting is that there's three categories that explain 93% of the entire sample, okay? So the vast majority of them were due to one of these three types of motivations. Now, interestingly, in the FBI's crime classification manual. These are also the FBI's three most common types of arson, according to the FBI's cases. So that's pretty good evidence you know, across the US and the UK that these are really the three main motivations behind fire setting behavior. You know, the other 12 categories in this study were much more minimal in terms of their prevalence. Okay, some only have one. Um, one arsonist in their in their group. Um, but these other includes a cry for help, attention, um, an attempt to get rehoused, an attempt at suicide, carelessness, which would be like the accidental type that we looked at, um, psychosis, which would be like the delusional type that we looked at, um, doing it for insurance fraud, crime concealment. Um, so again, you know, the arson is secondary, okay, they've maybe committed a murder and they're using fire to help get rid of evidence. Um, ho hoping to manipulate someone using arson. Um, heroism, which would be like the, the fire buffs, the kind of volunteer firemen, kind of hero complex. Um, proxy, depression, political motivation. Um, some of these I'm going to unpack as I talk about the FBI's range of classifications. Now, um, in the FBI, again, they often classify criminals as organized or disorganized. Um, the same is true for fire setters. And also, Scott motivate, um, split fire setters into two types, those that had motivation and those that didn't. Um, so some examples of dichotomous typologies. And in the FBI's crime classification manual, there are six types of fire setters that they outline. Um, those motivated by vandalism, excitement, and revenge, which remember also was the top three common in Rick's study. And then the next 
most common are crime concealment, profit, motivation, and extremist or terrorist-like behavior. Um, and I'll talk about each of these separately. So revenge, the, the most common in Rix's study and in the top three in the FBI's manual. Now, this could be at a particular person or it could be wider such as society as a whole or even at a particular institution. So for example, in Rix's study, one was a, a man in the local community who was intellectually disabled and he didn't really have any friends or family. And when he didn't receive any Christmas cards at Christmas, he responded by setting fires in the local community. Um, another was a mother who had her children removed by social services because of neglect um, and responded by setting fire at um, so the social services department. So, you know, according to the FBI, this can be personal retaliation, it can be societal, institutional, at a particular group, or to intimidate someone or some other. Some common characteristics of those revenge fire setters, usually adult males, usually, you know, basic high school education, um, live in rental property, have a working class job, are not usually loners, okay, so more social than some of the other types, but their relationships are typically short term and unstable. Um, quite often do have a history of criminal behavior that includes vandalism and um, also being intoxicated um, while committing crimes. They often establish a false alibi, okay, before committing the arson and then don't really revisit the crime scene. There are some differences between male and female revenge fire setters. Um, male revenge fire setters pretty much always um, target the place of residence. Okay, so target you know the workplace or the pl the person's house, you know some building. Um, female revenge fire setters typically target something that's owned by the individual, so their car, for example, or some property that they maybe have. <clears throat> One reason as to why the male revenge fire setters would be more likely to set a fire that results in a fatality. <clears throat> no, all education. No. So not that's not just college. Yeah, that's all education. <clears throat> Um, and then excitement motivated arson is the second most common in Rix's study and, and again top three in the FBI's model. Um, so this would be where sexually motivated arson comes in, okay. One of the case studies in Rix's paper um, is a young man who would set fires to buildings and then would go home and fantasize about having saved a young woman from the fire and her wanting to have sex with him as gratif um, gratitude for having been saved. Um, unsurprisingly, more likely to be males than females and serial arsonists are common amongst this group. Um, according to the FBI, they can be thrill seekers, attention seekers, recognition seekers, or sex driven offenders. Usually late teens, early 20s, young males, single, unemployed, living at home, um, usually loners with inadequate social skills. Um, and often they do stay behind at the scene to watch the fire or return to the crime scene afterwards. <clears throat> so, you know, if it attracts a, a group, you know, then they might be amongst the group watching the flames. Um, vandalism motivated arson then, typically you know, spontaneous, committed by disorganized offenders, um, quite often as part of a group, you know, juvenile groups are common here, quite often education facilities such as school buildings or community centers are common targets. Um, usually a history of poor school performance, a history of kind of minor arrests. Um, usually live close to the crime scene, but don't return to the crime scene. Um, quite often, um, evidence left behind, 
So maybe fingerprints you know, on the accelerant that's been left behind. Um, quite often other vandalism, graffiti, for example, left behind. Um, quite often, you know, smashing a window to get into the building to set the fire and then glass particles are found on their clothes when, um, when followed up on by police. So, you know, a more disorganized crime that usually leaves, around, leaves behind quite a lot of evidence. <clears throat> So the next, according to the FBI, is crime concealment. So again, the fire setting is secondary, right? It's to dispose of evidence. So for example, um, in the FBI's crime classification manual, they give an example of a group of young adults who broke into an elderly woman's home, robbed her, killed her, and then set the apartment on fire to hopefully get rid of the evidence. Now, while crime concealment is usually done by organized offenders, right? They're usually more organized and more likely to try and get rid of evidence. Crime concealment arson is more committed by disorganized offenders, okay? Because it's usually not a successful method of disposing of evidence, okay? It's unlikely that the fire will be powerful enough to get rid of all the evidence left behind at the scene, okay? So actually it's an ineffective way of um, disposing of evidence and trying to conceal the crime which is why it's usually committed by disorganized offenders. <clears throat> um, so crime concealment usually committed by organized, but crime concealment arson usually by disorganized, okay? Because it's an ineffective way of concealing the crime. Um, Profit motivated arson next, obviously for material gain, directly or indirectly. So it's the least passionate of motivations that we're discussing. The FBI discusses fraud, employment, um, competition. Um, seven of the cases in Rick's study were insurance fraud. Um, this includes a, a lifeguard who would set small fires at the place of work so he could get overtime to stay in cleanup afterwards. Um, five of the seven cases had a psychiatric diagnosis and four of them had personality disorders. <clears throat> and then extremist motivated arson, you know, for some, you know, often political cause. Um, so, you know, um, it could be for a social or religious cause. Um, Rix's study outlines two. Um, one was a butcher's shop, and you know the, the political message was anti-meat, and then the other was a bank, and anti-capitalism anti was the political message. But obviously, you know, it could vary from place to place and be whatever the agenda is, but it's some social or political cause behind the act of arson. Um, obviously, the victim is usually chosen very specifically, okay, because they're, you know, in line with what the offender is against, and usually it's very premeditated and organized. Um, the FBI gives the example of George Pateski, um, the mad bomber. A, a case I'll come back to when we talk about criminal profiling, um, but someone who kind of terrorized New York City for a number of years with, with bombs. Um, had been, as he saw it, un, um, wrongly let go from his employer. And this was really a kind of um, terrorist act at society for his um, kind of experience that he had to undergo. But a number of fire setting types, okay, based upon these number of classification systems, um, according to Miller, you know, there can be some, you know, discernible purpose, you know, like crime concealment or a political message or for profit or for revenge, or it could be for thrill seeking, whether that's part of the act of vandalism, because, you know, the vandalism act is usually thrill seeking in nature as part of the group, or whether it's a kind of solo offense motivated by excitement and obviously including sexual excitement and pyromania and just general thrill seeking. Um, but he also recognizes that there's going to be a significant overlap between these categories, okay? So like I said, 
at the beginning, you know, Peter George Dinsdale, you know, set fires for the most part because it kind of soothed him. Um, he felt a kind of urge to do so. But also when he was really angry at someone, he, you know, set fires also to get back at them. So there's going to be some overlap when it comes to motivations. <clears throat> Any questions so far on these different types? Yeah. Um, you can be tested on any of the theories that I've discussed. Yeah. So just having that kind of you know, basic knowledge of them will, will be enough. Um, the extremist motivated arson um, could be either solo offenders or groups um, for a kind of social cause, probably more likely to be part of a group. Um, some of the more kind of terrorist examples like George Vitesky, more solo, but could be either. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, there is some overlap there because he was really motivated by having been wronged by the company that um, that employed him. But I think why the FBI lists him as an example of a extremist motivated arson is he wasn't just setting fires at that company or you know people who worked for that company. He was just targeting society in general. So it was a kind of just terrorist act. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, okay, um, childhood fire setters then kind of individually studied, you know, again, but not too uncommon in the US on the high end estimates that are about 300 people a year die of fire set by children or teenagers. Um, in one early study, um, 60 children who were committed to a psychiatric hospital for fire setting, 60% were between the ages of six and eight. 35% between the ages of 11 and 15. Only two were female. And how much excitement they received from setting the fire positively correlated with age. Okay, so the older they were, the more excited they were by setting fires than the younger children. Extremely high rates of learning disabilities and other mental uh, disorders, okay, psychopathologies you know, from mood disorders to anxiety to conduct disorder and other externalizing behaviors. <clears throat> and also common was physical abuse and extreme neglect. Um, fire centers less likely to have had their biological mother in the house, more likely to have received severe punishments, including burns as punishments, okay? Um, remember, disorganized attachment is close, is common rather amongst fire setters, okay? So it's not too surprising that we often find cases of abuse in which the caregiver was the source of threat, okay? Because that's really what gives rise to disorganized attachment. Um, childhood fire setters high on the Minnesota multifastic personality inventory in a number of disorders anger, alienation, conduct disorder, depression, mania, schizophrenia, family problems. Um, and then a strong association between fire setting and childhood and antisocial personality disorder in adulthood. So quite often fire setting is, is one acting out problem associated with conduct disorder, okay? And conduct disorder is a precursor that often predicts antisocial personality disorder in adulthood. And maybe you've heard of the homicidal triad or McDonald's triad. In 1961, theorized that homicide could be predicted by childhood fire setting, childhood animal cruelty, and persistent bedwetting in childhood as well. 
um, a number of case studies were put forward to support this, you know, serial killers like David Berkowitz and other cases, you know, Jane Toppin and Thomas Piper, who did have at least two, if not three of these in their background. But overall, pretty little empirical support, okay, that homicidal offenders differ in these background characteristics substantially in comparison to um, non-homicidal individuals. Now, early interest in fire is not really that abnormal. Um, Gaynor says that there's kind of three developmental stages to fire setting in childhood. You know, fire interest, first of all, you know, some children will be kind of um, you know, mesmerized by seeing a fire. Um, as many as one in five have committed some small fire by age three, according to this research. Um, and then the next stage is kind of the fire play stage, okay, between fire five and nine, in which one might begin experimenting with fire, you know, you know, maybe helping with um, campfires or just kind of um, learning more about them. But um, by the age of 10, children have typically well understood the dangers of fire setting and understood then that it's, you know, not acceptable and dangerous to set fires, especially you know, unsupervised. Um, children who continue setting fires beyond this are the ones then proceeding to the fire setting stage. Okay. And it's these children who often have poor social skills, poor impulse control, and, and are substantially more likely to have been abused by their parents. So about 74% of child fire setters have a conduct disorder. And so it's typically now looked at through the lens of a conduct disorder rather than just trying to understand it separately, okay? Um, you know, usually it's one expression of many antisocial behaviors, okay? That might come with a conduct disorder. And so it's typically treated using the frameworks of an antisocial personality or conduct disorder rather than tailored interventions, particularly for fire setting. A couple of other types I'll briefly touch upon. Um, the firefighting fire setter. You know, in the US, about 100 firefighters are convicted of arson every year. Um, you know, it's an example of a hero syndrome, like I say, local volunteer firemen setting fires um, in order to get that kind of recognition from the community. Now, obviously, this is just a very small minority of fire setter, firefighters, right? The vast majority of firefighters are, you know, putting their life on the, on the line for other people and are, you know, courageous individuals. Um, but one example of a firefighting fire setter is John Orr, um, a chief arson investigator. And there's a conference held every year in California for um, invest, uh, arson investigators. And what they observed was that every time this conference was held, there was an act of arson committed somewhere locally in California. And soon the members of the conference began working out it had to be a member of the um, conference. Um, there's a number of documentaries on this. Pretty much every series like forensic um, science shows have, a, have, an exam have an episode on this. And you can find them on YouTube. It's, it's quite an interesting case and worth looking into in terms of how they found it was him. Once they did find it was him, convicting him wasn't particularly difficult because he had written a book manuscript about a chief investi arson investigator who sets fires. And the details were exactly just like the real cases that only the perpetrator would know. Um, so that was a you know, pretty good, as good as a confession, basically. <clears throat> Okay, and female fire setters make up about 14% of firefight fire setters. Um, very likely to have suffered sexual abuse, okay? Um, difficult, in fact, to find a convicted female serial fire setter who wasn't sexually abused. It's that common amongst this group. Often do suffer from depression or psychosis. So even more likely to suffer from mental illness than the male fire setters. Um, Unlikely to have any sexual fetish associated with fire setting, okay? Not likely to be sexually motivated. 
that are likely to use fire as a means of crying for help. Um, typically range from mid 20s to late 30s. And much like male fire setters, typically low IQ and poor education attainment. For those of you who watch Criminal Minds, I'm sure a number of you, um, the very second episode was about a um, female serial fire setter, right? It gives some insights into this kind of common characteristics. <clears throat> And then I'll, I'll briefly just talk about mentally disordered um, or delusional fire setters, but of course this is something that's you know, common amongst fire setters throughout. Um, you know, it's been long recognised that there's a clear connection between fire setting and mental pathologies. Um, one example was who set fire to the York Minster in um, York, England, who claimed to have been seeing religious um, hallucinations and was being told by God to burn down the minister. Um, individuals with a conduct control disorder often found to have low levels of serotonin, um, which might predispose them to more impulsive behavior. Okay, um, So might one possible tie-in with some disorders, particularly related to impulse control disorders and fire setting behavior. Um, in Australia, in one study, 37% of fire setters convicted had a psychiatric history in comparison to about 29% of other types of offenders and about 9% of the general public. Um, just before we finish up, a couple of final things to talk about in terms of reoffending and treatment. Um, you know, understanding recidivism as always, is hard because it's about you know how far how far do we follow up on in these studies, um, but they range anywhere from four to sixty percent. Um, but certainly, the the more fires one has committed is one good indicator as a risk factor that will increase the risk of one reoffending. <clears throat> Also more likely to reoffend if they were younger at the time they started the fire. Again, the number of fires they've committed. Lower intelligence also um, correlates with being more likely to set more fires if released. If they acted alone rather than as part of a group, more likely to reoffend. If there's no other criminal charges or no history of aggression, more likely to reoffend, which might not be intuitive, but you know, it's getting at why some people set fires when they're unable to confront the targets of their rage and don't have good um, coping mechanisms in place and so on, and are using this as an outlet. And prior suicide attempts also correlate with more likelihood of reoffending. Um, also, unstable childhood, earlier interest in fires, if they were abused by parents, history of bedwetting, if they were excited during the fire. So that's the the type that's most likely to reoffend, okay, if you're excited, and that's the motivation. And then psychiatric history as well are all risk factors for reoffending. Now, there haven't been any controlled trials when it comes to medication for fire setting or pyromania, um, but some have selected or, or suggested rather um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, hopefully helping with impulse control, right, if one has a better serotonin level. Most treatment focuses on dealing with the underlying mental illness, okay, what the actual mental disorder is and treating that. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy has also been shown to have some promise, especially with children. As usual, the younger um, intervention occurs, the more likely it is to be successful. But one large caveat, okay? Pretty much all of this research is on convicted arsonists, right? In psychiatric hospitals and in prison, right? But I've showed you at the beginning that this is one of the hardest crimes to investigate, one of the hardest to convict. Only about 17% of fire setters are convicted. So what we actually understand is about 
is details to do with this 17%, right? We know very little on the um, successful arsonists who weren't convicted for their crimes, okay? So obviously this is just a small subsection. Um, it's difficult therefore to generalize, right? Because so many are not convicted. And also if the research is done only in psychiatric hospitals, then again, that might be hard to generalize to um, non-psychiatric populations. Any questions on anything we've covered on fire setting? Any questions on the exam? Okay, if there is, you can come up and ask. Otherwise, best of luck with the next exam. I'll see you next week, okay, with the next lecture. <laughs>